Hello everyone, my guest today is Ori Greenberg. He is the CEO and co-founder of a company called AlgoPix, the only place to understand e-commerce market share pricing and promotions of your competitors and categories in real time. He's powering Fortune 50 CPGs and marketplaces. AlgoPix gives you a window into now, not weeks ago, with 1P plus 3P coverage. You can adjust your current market conditions, boost sessions and conversions with more relevant merchandising and pricing. All right, Ori, you ready to take us to the top? Yeah, thanks now, for having me. Now, you say in this bio that you put in here, the only place to understand e-commerce market share. I mean, there's a lot of players in this space. Why do you use the word the only place to understand this? We're actually the only ones who provide market share insights into sales that occur on Amazon.com as well as Walmart, eBay, Google Shopping, etc. There are other players that do only one of these platforms. Usually it's Amazon. And they're basing their data on scraped kind of information that we actually have transactional data. So that, that makes us unique in this that's space. A huge, that's obviously a huge advantage. So we want to understand this advantage. How did you get access to such exclusive data that nobody else can get access to? So we put it as obviously our goal to do that. So we support more than 70,000 brands and online sellers that share data with us in return for using free e-commerce tools. Okay, so you're not you're not getting a, a direct feed then from Amazon or from Walmart or from these e-commerce players. You're getting them from brands that use you. You then are using their data and selling it back to other people. We're processing and anonymizing the data and then reselling it. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Got it. Uh, why can't, sorry, I don't understand. Why can't somebody else do that? Well, they can. It's just a huge data set that requires a lot of data processing. I see. I see. Okay, so give me more of the backstory. We had you back on the show um, uh, earlier, but for people that missed that, what kinds of customers are, are you know the average user of your data? Is it mainly CPG brands? So it would be the CPG brands as well as the um, marketplaces themselves. We have customers like Google Shopping, Facebook's Marketplace, Walmart, so both. Okay, both. And you founded the company in 2016, correct? That's correct. And walk me through sort of how you've grown over the past 12 months. You know, last time we came on, I believe it was... I think middle last year, right? Wow, I think it was maybe two years ago, something like that. Okay, maybe two years ago even. Um, you know, obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's a lot more happening on e-commerce over the past 18 to 24 months. How's that impacted your business? I think when you came on, you said you were working with about 2,000 customers. How many are you working with today? So a lot more. We started by serving uh, SMBs. Uh, we grew and, and went up market to kind of mid-level customers. Uh, and we're now serving probably Fortune 50, Fortune 100 companies as enterprise, large enterprise customers. So I would say we have probably about 5,000 SMBs uh, that we're walking, we're, we're walking away from that business model. We need to focus on the larger uh, uh, companies. Probably about a couple of dozens of mid-sized companies paying probably a thousand dollars a month on average. Yep. Um, and we're now focusing on companies able to pay six, seven figures to get tons of value and, and actually increase their market share. And how many of those kinds of customers do you currently have? Probably about a dozen. A dozen. Do they graduate up? I mean, can't they start as an SMB, then move to a grand a month, then move to 10 grand a month? Well, they can. Uh, but now that our solution supports really the biggest companies, we focus on getting to them initially and not kind of mature the existing customers. It's just a different sales process, different type of customer. Mm -hmm. and, and so how is this, you know, churning off grandfather accounts is obviously sort of a delicate act. You don't want negative word of mouth hitting the market, um, but you also don't want to force them into a plan that's 10 times what they're used to paying. So how do you gracefully churn these folks off? Great question. Uh, realizing that that's not our market, but still supporting the product because it's the same kind of infrastructure for the enterprise product. We're going to give our product away for free. And that's our kind of way to thank the community. So we, we're going to continue to support. We have over 70,000 free users. We're going to continue supporting them. I see. Okay. Now those 5,000 SMBs on your platform, are they still paying that smaller ARPU, about $20 a month? Yes. Yes. We, we do encourage them to kind of walk away from the paying model to the data sharing model, which mm -hmm. would benefit them and us. And in terms of your total monthly revenue right now, how much of it is still SMB focused? Uh, less than less than forty percent. Okay, got it, got it. So five thousand at twenty bucks a month is about a hundred grand a month. And if that's forty percent of your revenue, total revenue is something closer to what two twenty a month right now, two thirty. 
I love your real time calculations. <laughs> you're, you're great. We, uh, so S and P average $34 a month. So it's a little bit more, but you got the number, the numbers, uh, about right. Okay. Got it. So, so total business caught $230,000 per month. That's obviously up significantly since our interview a long time ago, but what is that up year over year? Um, I must tell you that these are the numbers that we're aiming to complete 2020 uh, with, but it's it, it changed dramatically over the past 12 months since we started focusing on enterprise customers. Well, I guess the, a, a, a more clear question I should have asked was exactly 12 months ago, how much were you doing per month? Uh, we grew about 300% last year. Okay, so over the past 12 months, you've grown revenue about 300%? That's correct. Okay, got it, got it. So that would, you know, Again, if you're doing about two thirty uh, per month right now, two hundred thirty thousand, that would be up from seventy thousand uh, a month about a year ago. Something like that. And and would you credit most of that? It sounds like you would. You'd credit most of that growth to onboarding these thousand dollar month accounts, or these dozen or so even bigger accounts than that. The enterprise deals. The enterprise deals are the biggest growth engine. Where I believe that by the end of twenty twenty one, we'll still stop supporting the medium sized businesses. Yep, and have them all enjoy your free plan. Hopefully. Have you been able to do this without raising additional capital or did you do an additional raise? No, we didn't need to raise. We generated more revenues than expected. That's great. So still only 3 million raised? Yes. And last time you came on, you were still burning to drive growth. Are you still burning you know, and you're comfortable with it or have you gotten back to break even? Um, we're still burning, uh, but we're okay. We have a decent runway and our existing investors are always there to back us up if we spend more than we planned on, which hasn't, hasn't happened. We're on the good side of COVID, I'd say. Yeah. Why, why? I mean, most e-commerce friends right now, if they've got capital they can access, they want it so they can drive growth right now. I mean, e-commerce is the thing right now and people can't go out and shop. I mean, you haven't raised. Does that mean you're not quite sure where to spend money to get new enterprise customers? No, we plan on raising funds in Q2 2021. We need oh, to I see. probably grow our sales team and... and Focus on that. You're right. It why sense. is that though? You already have great growth, 300% year over year. Why do you? Why wait to raise? We're not ready organization wise. Okay. We need to do it in a healthy way. The, the question is, it makes sense. It's just not the right timing for us. So, how many folks are on the team today? Uh, I'd rather not talk about that. If you're okay with it, uh, I'm I'm okay not pushing there. I am curious why you feel like that's a competitive advantage to, for people not to know your team size. Right. Why is that an advantage? Well, if I tell you that, then I'll tell you the team size. But I think we're very effective in terms of uh, uh, producing the product versus the number of, you know, the headcount. Um, yeah, I mean, look, one of my favorite things to measure is revenue per employee, right? Teams that can do more with a, a less number of employees are obviously, you know, great businesses. Uh, but that being said, if I go to your website and, and click on your LinkedIn link in the footer, a LinkedIn profile, we can go there and see it lists 17 employees. So I'm just a little confused why they're listed on LinkedIn, but you wouldn't want to reveal them in a podcast. Well, I'd rather not say the number, but you have right about the number. It's it's plus or minus that number. I see. You, you meant the reason I wanted to go here is because you mentioned your sales or getting in the right spot to be able to uh, raise the right amount and not raise too quickly. Do you, do you have quota carrying sales reps now or are you still doing all the sales? I'm doing most of the sales. Okay. So, I mean, are you nervous about that? How do you pass that playbook off to somebody else and, and trust them enough to execute? I can't wait to learn from other people about that. This is my first time doing enterprise sales. I'm sure I'll learn a lot. I wouldn't say nervous. I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, I just feel like I am not in a position to give someone the handbook yet. And I feel like when I hire, it should come with a basic handbook. So we're still learning. We're good. We have a good product market fit in the marketplace segment, but we still need to finalize, kind of make sure we have a good product market fit on the brand and CPG space. So that's something I focus on. And what is that playbook look like today? How are you adding new accounts? So uh, Zoom Info has been very helpful in kind of mapping the market, sizing the market, realizing all the relevant players and, and within the organization, the buying persona. Uh, it's just making people um, react. That's the playbook and making sure we do it in an automatic, scalable way. So when we reach out to a new prospect, delivering insights on that first cold email, that's what we're building. 
and you're saying Zoom Info is helping you find that prospect to reach out to. Right. What are you, you have to give Zoom Info input so they can sort. What sort of inputs are you giving them? Company size, categories. It's very basic, actually. Okay. And so company size is what, Fortune 50? And what's the job title? So over $25 million in revenue would make them relevant. Okay. You charge six, seven figures, that, that should be their size. Um, and the right categories, you know, retail, e-commerce, brick and mortar, whatever. It's about 14,000 companies. Uh, that's our market. And what's the job title of the person you're trying to reach? It could be from a data team uh, to a catalog team to a category manager, brand manager. It's different between marketplaces and brands, but that's that's the titles. If your tool helps people manage, you know, price sensitivity, I mean, wh- why aren't why doesn't that fall under like a CRO sort of role? We would need that next year, definitely. Okay, got it. So, I mean, you just mentioned data team, catalog team, brand manager. Um, I mean, CRO is related to marketing usually. And right now we can tell you the market share, for example, and what changes in that market share. And you can only act on it or mainly should act on it as a brand manager or category manager. These are insights that would help you play within the category. As a CRO, you would need to kind of adjust marketing budget. So you would need to measure how marketing campaign was effective and help you increase the market share versus um, kind of the, the actions that you do. And we don't have that connection between the marketing spend and market share measurement directly yet. So it's still a working process. I see. I see. Interesting. Okay, very good. Um, what is your, I mean, next year, when you scale your sales, you know, I mean, do you, are you, how are you going to test? I mean, this is a moment that every SaaS founder goes through is how you test your first couple sales hires. How are you going to go about that test? You know, some people say hire two, so you get an A-B test. One say yeah. hire one, invest all. Some say hire as many as you can, then fire all the ones that don't hit quota. What are you going to do? I hope I won't make that mistake and I will get help from other founders who will help make the right choice. But being realistic, I will probably make that mistake. And uh, I suppose I'll hire a pod, pod of three. That is what we have in mind right now, right? A sales leader, a sales manager, and an SDR. Mm-hmm. And hopefully we'll get uh, everyone right the first time. Probably not, but aiming to to get it right. Even if the sales team is great, if churn's too high, it doesn't matter how much folks you bring in the top of the funnel. What does gross revenue churn look like today? Oh, we we don't see any churn at all. For the the enterprise customers, which is the focus, I mean, they continue building features and capabilities over our engine. So I'm not concerned about churn. Uh, Sorry, the reason I asked about gross revenue churn instead of gross logo churn is you just articulated you're you're intentionally churning off the revenue from these 5,000 SMBs which currently still makes up over $100,000 of your of your revenue. So yeah. I think you will you do see churn. That type of churn, I'm not concerned about it. I think if, if we're talking about fundraising or company valuation wise, since this is not our focus, since we're stepping away from that model, and no one is looking at that revenue or counting that revenue. So I don't count it as churn. Um, well, hold on, hold, well, hold on, you can't have it both ways. You just told me revenue was $230,000 a month. And you said 40% of that revenue is the SMB. So you are counting it. Well, we calculated the revenues, but if we were to raise funds, it would be based on the SMBs. I would discount that revenue. So you would just say, hey, we're doing $130,000 a month in revenue. You know, We've got some more money. We've got a better runway because we do have that revenue, but it's not the business that anyone would invest in or anyone would acquire because of, right? Yep. Got it. Okay. It makes good sense. What about CAC? So to land a new customer paying you $1,000 a month. What are you going to spend to get that? Excuse me. Can you please repeat the question? Sure. To land a new customer paying you $1,000 per month, what's your CAC look like? Well, we since, since the sales team is very thin right now, it doesn't really cost us a lot of money. It's just called emailing. As we scale up, I, I assume that will just be an enterprise sales business model. Will, the cost will probably be 20%. Well, there, there must be other things you include in the cost to acquire a customer besides f- literally fixed salary expenses associated with an account executive. Right now, nothing. What else? You do don't you value any? your time? Aren't you doing all the sales right now? I value my time. It's probably 30% of my time is dedicated to sales, but I didn't price it that way. If you don't have a good idea of what CAC is right now, how do you know what to set quota at and, and things of this nature for the first sales hires you make? 
Um, it's basically, it's going to be based on my achievements in 2020. So I know what their goal should be, should be better than me. Um, but basically I know their goal and I know their expectations versus the base price, um, base salary, if that makes sense. Why do you expect that someone you hire and bring in that, you know, owns nowhere near as much of equity as you do, they're not the founder, they're just running the company. Why do you expect that they're going to be better than you at selling? Aren't you going to be, be the best ever? I'm a data person. I'm an engineering character. I'm not the pushiest salesperson. I'm not that experienced uh, in that. That's my first time selling an enterprise product while being my third company. Um, I do expect, and that that's true about every manager that I bring. They should be better than me at pretty much everything. Yeah, no, it's it's it, there, a lot of founders when they make the first sales hire, they make the assumption that that first sales hire should sell more than the founder, and it's almost never the case because the founder knows the product. The founder has an unfair advantage because customers always want to talk to the founder. There's a little bit of a celebrity factor there, but you're going in expecting that that first sales hire should sell more than you've sold over the past twelve months. Yeah, I I, I might be wrong, uh, but that's my expectation. I mean, I, I do spend 30% of my time doing it, and they'll spend hopefully 120% of their time doing that. I just hope that they'll get rich doing it and do that because it's their passion. So I do, I do expect that to come into play. Yeah. What is a, I mean, you're an engineer. You know that 120% of their time doesn't exist. That's impossible. You have 100% of a day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if uh, an average person works for uh, eight, nine hours a day, I expect them to enjoy their work so much. And I, I, I have the same feeling, right? People are excited about our product, excited about our solution. If uh, I had more hours a day, I would do that. I would work, work more. Fair enough. All right. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Oh, uh, I didn't prepare for that. But I guess uh, the hard thing about Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. Number is, two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Uh, I'm keeping track of uh, Jonathan Thir- Shirky, I think it's pronounced, from uh, Content Square. And uh, Alastair uh, McLean, uh, he's the founder of uh, Tychometrics, which is in our space, and he's doing very well. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building the company? I would say Zoom, Zoom Info, HubSpot, super helpful these days. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? About six. Six is enough. And Ori, what's your situation? Married, single kiddos? Uh, Happily married with two uh, kids, Uh, Ben, who's one-year-old, Ronnie, who's three-year-old, and uh, we continue counting. Ben and Ronnie and Algo picks. How old are you, Ori? Uh, I'm, uh, shit, I'm 36 already. (laughs) All right. Last question. What's something you wish you knew when you were 20? I would probably, I spent about six years in academia, becoming an engineer at the NBA, and I would probably choose to fail three, setting up three companies and would learn more from doing that than, than doing the, the time I did. Guys, there you have it. Algo picks moving from working with 5,000 SMBs. These are CPG brands, merchandising brands, you know, doing $100,000 in revenue to moving upstream, you know, mid-market Fortune 500 folks. They've scaled revenue as they've made that transition up to call it a $2.6 million run rate today, up from call it a million dollar run rate just a year ago. So almost 300% year over year growth as they look to scale, still doing all this capital efficiently, just off $3 million raised, looking to potentially raise in Q2, Q3 after they make some key hires in their sales organization, currently about call it between 15 and 17 folks on the team. All right. Thanks for taking us to the top. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. Keep safe. One more thing before you go. We have a brand new show every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central. It's called Shark Tank for SaaS. We call it Deal or Bust. One founder comes on, three hungry buyers, they try and do a deal live, and the founder shares back-end dashboards, their expenses, their revenue, ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it, and the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember, these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell mode notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big sale, a big profitability statement, or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS 
founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at nathanlacka.com forward slash slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right. I'll be in the comments. See ya.